you have your Bible, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5, as we continue on teaching in the book of uh, Revelation. And, um, and it's so important, I don't have the time really to go back and do all of the <clears throat> recap, but the book of the Revelation is a, a book that was given to John by Jesus Christ to reveal His second coming. And He addresses Him, so John sees Him now not as the a meek lamb that was crucified, but the risen, resurrected lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and John gives, <clears throat> Jesus gives John some letters to deliver to churches that represent uh, all of the churches for all time. Uh, the, the problems that were in those churches are, have always been in churches. The correction in God's word to those churches are the same for all. And uh, so he, he, he set the scene for what he wanted to see happening in the churches. Then in chapter 4, we move, John moves from being on the earth, receiving letters to the churches, to being caught up into heaven through an open door in which the, the Spirit of the living God, Jesus Christ, called him into heaven. And the first thing that we saw in chapter 4 was there was a throne. We emphasize the fact that God is ruling and reigning from the throne. We saw the picture of the throne and the scenario around it is one of judgment. And, uh, and that all of the people in, all of the parties in heaven, to include the angels, the cherubim, the 24 elders, which we said was the um, resurrected church, they're all worshiping the one who sits on the throne for being the sovereign creator. Okay? Now, that's where chapter 5 opens up. Chapter 5 is not something that happens separately. It just means that now a focus has shifted. Uh, it's the same scene but the focus is being shifted. So we're just going to read chapter 5. It's only 14 verses, so here we go. <clears throat> and I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. <clears throat> but one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And then he came and took the scroll out of the hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, <clears throat> worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we are gathered here in your house to hear what your spirit has to say to us. Please help me with the words that you give to me and through the scriptures that we turn to and read this morning to accurately uh, preach and to teach what is happening in the scriptures here. And God, let the heart of the church be lifted up and encouraged and god help us to look forward to with great anticipation the soon and any moment return of our lord and savior jesus christ i prayed in jesus name 
Amen. Okay, so what we see here, <clears throat> when the scene opens up, it's in heaven. And now, in chapter 4, the focus was the one who sits on the throne. That's God the Father. It doesn't describe Him in a shape or a form. It describes Him as light. We talked about that. Now the focus goes towards a scroll. And there's a search that goes about in chapter 5 for someone who is able to open the scroll. And we find out, I'm kind of summarizing this now, and we're going to go back and highlight it uh, <clears throat> bit by bit. We find out that there is no one in all of human history and in all of creation, there is not a, a person, there's not a demon, there's not a devil, there's not an angel, there's not a government, there's not a nation, there's not a movement, there's nothing. No one of any kind is qualified, i.e. worthy, to open this scroll. Save the Lord Jesus Christ. Only He is the one who is capable of ruling. No man, no angel, no demon. And He is the one who is rightfully... It, the, the, the contract that we're getting ready to discover, the contract and the covenant is one that only He can execute. He is the only one worthy and capable of ruling over the entirety of of creation. That's what we're talking about. Now, <clears throat> we're going to see in this in the chapter 5 that Jesus is the rightful ruler and that he's returning, he's coming back to the earth to redeem his people and his creation from sin and Satan and death and the curse. You say, Pastor Randy, wait a minute. Now, I thought that that occurred at the cross. It did. The Victory was won, and the enemy has been defeated. But what we saw happen in time on the cross, the ramifications, the full disclosure of the depth and the width and the height of all that was accomplished at the cross has not been seen, certainly not understood, and neither has it fully come to pass. We have seen in the first advent of Christ, that is His coming to the earth, the, what we call the initiation of the kingdom. What we see in the book of the Revelation is the consummation of the kingdom. And you and I in the church age right now, which really is in chapters 2 and 3 of this book, we live in the tension between what has been declared and what has actually come to pass. Between what was purchased and what has proven itself in, in reality, we live in the tension of the, all, of the almost but not yet. Is everybody following me? We live in the tension of the almost but not yet. Having come but not fully come. And so we have to see, we have to understand that what's getting ready to happen is that, that when the church is caught up and now uh, the old uh, old slides into the new, and now the tension is going to be removed, and all that was promised by God and all that was purchased by Jesus will fully and finally come to pass. So that when the book is closed, when this book is over, when this contract, this scroll, has fully been executed front and back, we will be at the place where there is a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to be at the place where there will never again be sickness or disease or death or war or sadness or sorrow or brokenness. That the book of the Revelation is going to reveal the period of time where God is going to move quickly to bring to pass in seven years' time, to bring to pass and to end the story with all things having been reconciled back to Him and restored into the eternal state. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, I'll give you a picture of this. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that spiritually speaking, because God declares those things that be not as though they were, 
that God sees us seated right now in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's, that's where we end up. But where are we right now? On the fourth row at New Beginning Family Worship Center in Northport, Alabama. So what God is going to do is take and compress time and fulfill His contract and His covenant and His promise. And He's literally going to take us from here to there and fulfill in time and space what He has declared to be the truth from eternity. Does everybody follow me? In other words, God has given to us the cliff notes. And now the whole book is going to come in to pass. All right, so let's look at this for a second. First of all, I want you to see, uh, I wrote this down, and I'm going to go to a lot of Scripture. So today I'm going to do a little bit more teaching than I am preaching because I think it's imperative that you get this. I, I, not that I'm the smartest guy uh, in the room, I'm not. Not that I got it all together, figured out I don't. I have more questions than I have answers. But, but the Lord has allowed me, and not just me, there's many others, but we are the minority, to see with clarity what He's getting ready to do here. I will say this. <clears throat> if you don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture and you believe in a post-tribulational rapture, i.e. Christ comes back at the very end, you cannot make heads or tails out of the book of the Revelation. And you have to allegorize everything, meaning that you have to attach some superstitious symbol to it and say that it's already occurred. And that's about as dumb as a sack of rocks. <clears throat> and I'm going to disclose it to you from the Scriptures this morning. But here's what I want you to see. God's going to restore the earth and creation in general and Israel in particular. If you lose sight of the nation of Israel, the rest of the book doesn't make any sense to you. All right, so we're going to go over that. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Let's read this. Everybody just track with me. Now, this is what this was the book of Hebrews. The writer we, we think to believe is Paul. He's writing to some people who are thinking about backtracking on their salvation. So he's giving to them spiritual truths to help them see the security of their salvation and the idiocy of considering turning back on God. And here's what he say. For he, that's God, has not put the world to come. That's the future. That's the end of Revelation. He has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the work of works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under His feet. Let's stop right there. What He's saying is, is that God has placed all authority under the feet of men. That in the future, God's redeemed people in the future consummated kingdom will rule and reign over God's creation with Him. Now He's saying that He's done that. He's secured that at the cross. But we have not, watching that, it's going to say, but we do not see it yet, watch. For having put all things in subjection under His feet, little h means human beings, big H would be Jesus. For in that He, that's God, put all in subjection under Him, that's man, He left nothing that is not put under Him. But now, somebody say now, we do not yet see all things put under Him. Now, here's something that I'm, I was trying to explain to you. God has done something and declared something that men are going to rule and reign over His creation. We're going to do that under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do not yet see it. That's what the book of the Revelation is, is about. Bringing to fruition... This, this truth. We do not yet see all things put under Him. What do we see? But we see Jesus, who is our human representative. He is, you're going to hear this again in great, greater detail in a minute. He is our kinsman redeemer. 
And what we once owned and lost, which is ruling and reigning with God in the garden, didn't God say, didn't God put man and Adam over all the things in the garden? Didn't God put man over the earth and gave him charge? Well, who came and took that? Actually, Satan did not take that. We gave it away. We surrendered it. And so the cross was our human representative and God himself coming to the cross to, at that point, in all of eternity, undo what happened in the garden. But we have not yet seen it all undone. It's all been executed. It's all been paid for. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when you got saved, the Spirit of God came into you and came into me. And you know what the Bible tells us about that? That that Spirit is God's down payment on His purchased possession. All that God is going to do for you with regards to what Christ has already done for you has not yet been realized. So it says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. In other words, before we can rule and reign, we've got to have our debt paid. And the one who paid our debt was Jesus Christ. And he has redeemed us back unto God, and we have become heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And we are in the economy and mind of God, seated in heavenly places in Christ, and we are ruling and reigning with Christ in the mind of God, but in time and space, we're still here. But the book of the Revelation is about how God compresses human history into seven years to bring about, at the end, the fullness of what He's already purchased. Are you with me? All right, here we go. All right, let's go to the next. Let's go back to verse. Uh, let's go to Daniel chapter seven. Now we're going to talk about Israel in particular, creation in general, Israel in particular. Here we go, Daniel seven. I was watching in the night visions. This is Daniel. And behold, one like the Son of Man. Now, Daniel has been praying. And Daniel is in captivity. And God has come to Daniel. And he's going to reveal that beginning with Babylon, there's going to be four great or five great kingdoms on the earth. And he gives them the disclosure of what he's, how that, those kingdoms are going to play out over time. So this is, this, is, this is what Daniel sees in the vision, which is the answer to his prayers about what's going to happen. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancients of days, and they brought him before him. Then to him was given, who, who is that? That's the one that came to the ancient of days. Then was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He's describing the coming of Christ at the end. Which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. All right, that's Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Now look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 23, 27. This is, this is what's going to happen now. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel. Somebody say Israel. Key player in the book of the Revelation. And presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. He's getting ready to disclose what's going to happen. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Leave it, for, leave it look back up for, there. Now what he's telling them is, he says, God has a plan for the nation of Israel. It's a 490-year plan. What we have as of today is the 
is the, um, the passing by of 483 years. Quickly, if you went to the north side, was 490 minus 483? Seven. In chapter 5 that we just read, the last seven years begin, begin with the unsealing of the scroll. And that's, that's what God started with the nation of Israel, 70 weeks. For your people, that's Israel, and your holy, holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish the transgression. What does that mean? to finish or put an end to their rejection of Christ, to make an end of their sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. This is all with regards to Israel and Jerusalem. To bring in, that's the end of the book, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up vision and prophecy. Put an end to the rest of the story and to finally anoint, that is to crown, Jesus is the ruler and the reigner, uh, the ruler and the one who reigns over all creation. All right, let's go to the next one. Now, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, this is all about the time that I just told you about the 483 years. So we'll just go past that. Next set of verses. Then he shall confirm, and who's he? He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That one week is seven days, representative of seven years. That's what they're talking about, weeks of years. The he is the Antichrist. The Antichrist shall confirm a covenant with many for seven years. But in the middle of the week, that's in the middle of the seven years, what's the middle of seven? Three and a half years. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. That means he's going to set himself up in the temple as the one to be worshipped and declare himself to be God, even until the consummation. Uh oh, there, that, see, that's the end. Which is determined, is poured out on the desolate and the desolator, meaning that God brings full and final wrath upon the Antichrist. Let's, let's look at Zechariah chapter 12. I'm setting the stage for this now. Zechariah 12, let me hurry up. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah, and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. Now look at verse 9. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, the reason I'm saying this is, is right after we end chapter 5 and we start chapter 6 through 19, all of these things that Zechariah said is going to happen is going to happen. Okay, now let's go to um, Zechariah 14, 1 and 2. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. That's the, that's the tribulation. And your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Meaning that God is going to allow Israel to be attacked. He's going to draw the nations into a war there. And he's going to settle accounts with the Gentile nations for their treatment of the Jews and their reje rejection of the gospel. So now we see there's a scroll. Now, that's the setup for the message. Now we see a scroll. John sees a scroll in chapter 5. And written in on it, on the inside and the back, written inside on the uh, front and back, and it's sealed up. Now you say, what, what? Now this is why I'm going back to Daniel. And this is why you have to read the book of the Revelation in the context of Daniel and Ezekiel, the Old Testament prophets. You have to read it in that through their lens, and you have to read it in the context that God is not finished dealing with Israel. So watch now. We have seen this book already. You say, well, I haven't seen this book. In, it's in Revelation chapter 5. Where did I see it in the book? You saw it in the book of Ezekiel, and you saw it in the book of Daniel. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Look up. Now, this is Ezekiel. Now, when I looked, 
There was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it out before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside. Is that, did we just read that? There was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Doesn't that sound like the book, we, the scroll we're getting ready to open? Okay. Now let's look at Daniel 9.24. Here's the confirmation. But the scripture tells us, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. <clears throat> That's not, no, no, no. Well, let me go. I gave you the, I gave you the wrong verse, but I want to read this first. That's why I'm going to go back to it. Go to Daniel. Do you have Daniel 12, 4? You have Daniel 12, 4? There it is. There it is. There's the book. What? Look. But you, Daniel, shut up the words. Now stop. Look this way. What were the words about? Israel. Wasn't Daniel receiving a, a vision of the last days of Israel? He said, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. What does he mean? I'm not disclosing to you now. You're not ready for it. But as time goes forward and as my Messiah comes and as the cross comes into play and his resurrection, people are going to go, are going to gain more knowledge so that when I unfold the book to show them what I'm going to do, it'll make sense. Does that make sense? And knowledge shall increase. All right. <clears throat> do I have another verse? Is that the end of it? Okay. So... This, this scroll is written on the inside and the back. The Romans used it. The Jews used it. They used it for anything from, you know, selling land to getting married to having some sort of contract, a will. And only the person, when it was sealed, only the person that was legal, the person that was legally worthy, i.e., entitled to open it, was the one who was able to execute it. In other words, you couldn't open the will that was given to me because it was it was made to me. You can't open my will. You can't open my contract. You have no authority. So that's why they went through all of heaven and earth and all of creation to see who was able, but no one was able except Jesus. That's where the lamb comes out and the lion comes out in chapter 5. A kinsman redeemer, a legal representative, one who meets all of the requirements, is able to open the contract. This is all about, this is all set up uh, under the pretext of the Old Testament uh, in the book of Leviticus, if you owned land, if you were a Jew and you owned land and you became impoverished or you owed a debt and they took your land from you, uh, you became the servant of the one who took your land because of some debt. That's what happened to us in sin. All that God gave to us to include the earth and everything, we lost it. And Satan took control of it. Now, the only person... The only person who can get that land back from us is someone that's kin to us and who has, meets three requirements. We'll go over that in just a second. The kinsman redeemer must be a legal, uh, may, must be of blood, meaning of a family kin or a legal representative who has the right given to open the contract. In verses 2 through 4 of chapter 5 uh, of the book of the Revelation, now we see it's moved from the scroll, and it's, there is a search for who is worthy to open the scroll. And as we said, no one, could, no one was found worthy. So John wept. Now the question is, is why would John cry over this? Why, John doesn't even know what's on the scroll, does he? Or does he? John understands, John is able to see because what happened was when they sealed the scroll, they would write on the outside, there's seven seals, they would write on the outside basically a, a, one, a one word or a one sentence summary of what was inside. So there's seven words or seven sentences or seven summaries of what's inside this scroll. John can see it. But yet John sees that there's no one worthy to execute the contract. There's no one worthy to open the scroll. And so what he understands is, by looking at the scroll, 
is that the redemptive history and God's plan of consummating His kingdom cannot be executed because there's no one in sight at this time in the throne room that's worthy to open the scroll. So basically what he sees is the, is the emptiness and the futility and the pain and the sorrow that lies before all of humanity in a, ongoing and ongoing and ongoing with no end because the only way it can end is for someone to open the scroll and execute the contract. So he's broken. And the word that it uses there for wept is the same word that the writer uses, John writes, uh, that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. It's a broken heartedness. It's like the loss of a loved one. And basically, John is looking at the, the demise, the eternal demise of human history, unless this scroll can be opened. He's saying, we have no hope. And that all of the prayers that we see later here, all of the prayers that have been prayed, and all of the hopes of the people are dashed, and they'll never come to fruition if someone is not found worthy to open the scroll. And while he's weeping, an elder comes and says, stop weeping for the Lamb of God and the Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the scroll. The answer has just walked into the room. He is the worthy one. He is the kinsman redeemer. He, the kinsman redeemer must meet three criteria in order to execute a contract of redeeming back what his kin has lost. Let's look at it. First of all, he must be related to him in his humanity. We find in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, and then verse 21. It says, Matthew 1, 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. That's, that's our kinsman redeemer. He's come. Now let's look at verse 21. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because the name of Jesus means God, God's salvation. For he will save his kinsmen from their sins. That's why the word became flesh. Because all of us as human beings have lost everything through Adam. And you say, well, that's not fair. Well, you, you and I have done our share too, right? And we've lost it all. And we have no one to get it back except Jesus. So God sent him in the likeness of human flesh. He came to be like us so that he could redeem us. Look at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. That rod is a capital R. That's Jesus. And it means that he comes out of the bloodline of Jesse. A branch will grow out of Jesse's roots. Who was Jesse's roots? David. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, look at verse 12. And he will set up a banner for the nations and he will assemble. Say it ain't so. The outcast of Israel and gathered the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Not only is he coming to save us from our sins, he's coming to and to reconcile people, but he's gonna, he's gonna make it right with Israel. All right, now let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which the tribe of Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood, and then go to 2.14. Inasmuch then as the children, that's me and you, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise, shared in the same, in the same human, humanness, that through death, that's what he did, he went through death on our behalf, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. That he might destroy the one who had the power of death. Okay. So, he, had, he's related, he meets the criteria of being, uh, uh, of being human and being related to us. The second criteria is he must be willing to redeem us. And the scripture tells us his love qualified him, uh, I mean, his humanity qualified him as our kinsman, but his love was the motivating factor, John 3.16, and you know the verse. For God 
so loved the world. Let's read it this way. For our kinsman redeemer so loved the prisoners of sin that he gave his only begotten son, the kinsman redeemer, that whosoever believed in him, that is our kinsman redeemer, would not perish but have everlasting life because our kinsman redeemer came to buy us back from the law of sin and death and to give us everlasting life. Let's look at Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. See, he was, Jesus was motivated to come to our rescue. He did not do it begrudgingly. He didn't do it. He, 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 wasn't, he wasn't sad sacking it to the cross. The Scripture said he did it because he loved us and that there was joy set before him. He knew that the end game was greater than any pain that he had to walk through. Then lastly, he must have the means to do it. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Death had to be paid. Blood had to be shed. The Bible says in Leviticus that the life is in the blood. Let's look at Hebrews 9 and 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Notice now where he went with the blood. He went to the throne of God because it was God we owe to death. And he took payment straight into the throne room. Now let's look at uh, chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Now, guys, this is what I told you about the tension, Right? From that time, that is his resurrection and ascension, from that time, waiting, somebody say waiting, till his enemies are made his footstool. See, he's conquered them all, but we don't see them all under his feet yet. See, God's, there's some, there's some redeemed people of God today that have COVID. Now, Jesus' name is above every name. It's above the name of COVID. Yet they have COVID. Some people have died from COVID. But the, but the blood of Jesus is so strong and so powerful that he can let death have its way and then pick you up out of death and raise you up to newness of life. The Bible says that he went through death. He didn't walk up there to it and mock it. He went through it and came out on the other side and turned around and said, Oh, death, where's your sting? What, how do you like me now? As old Toby Keith said in his song, How do you like me now? Now that I'm on my way, death thought it had won. But Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, went all the way into that grave and all the way out the back side of it and stood up and says and tells the church in this world you're going to have tribulation but be of good cheer I've overcome the world I took everything it had I came out on the other side more than a conqueror and because I'm your kinsman redeemer kin to you in your flesh kin to you in your spirit kin to you in my blood and because I love you you're a winner to me. So just take it easy until all of my enemies are made my footstool. And that's what the book of the Revelation is about, the enemies of God being made his footstool. <clears throat> Jesus Christ came and shed his blood. His first coming was as the lamb. His second coming will be as the lion. His first coming was a meekness that initiated the spirit the spiritual kingdom, his second coming will be a greatness that con consummates his kingdom. And then lastly, they began to sing the song of the worthy one. As Jesus takes possession of the scroll, as Jesus takes possession of the scroll, all of heaven, all of the players there begin to break out in singing. The long-anticipated consummation is about to occur. The scripture says 
that all the prayers of the saints of the ages are in the buckets up there, these, these golden bowls of these buckets. All these prayers are in these buckets, and they're holding them. Now, guys, here's something that I need you to understand. That many, many times you've prayed, Oh, Lord, heal my mama. Oh, Lord, deliver my brother. Oh, Lord, take away this guilt. Oh, God, raise him up. And seemingly, God said no. God does not have a no for the believer. He has a wait. Wait until I make your enemies your footstool. And all of your prayers, that you haven't seen the answer to, God's got them in a bowl. And when the scroll is open, they begin to shout because they understand that all of the wait a minutes, all of the not nows, all the it's coming, all of the hold on is about to be answered. That every promise of God and every prayer that you've ever prayed that looks like it got hung up between here and there God's fixing to stamp it with the yes and the amen you're going to see not your mama healed from cancer you're going to see your mama well and never sick again you're not going to see your brother delivered from drugs only to hope that he never gets involved again you're going to see your brother stone cold sober for the rest of eternity Because he's going to wrap this thing up. And all the middle ground is going to be erased. And what God has declared from eternity to be true is going to come to pass. And then shall we say that death is swallowed up in victory. That's why, that's why the saints are shouting. It's a, it's a throne of judgment. It's a throne where there's going to be a lot of people die on the earth. There's lightnings and thunders, and there's going to be... But they see the end game. It finally clicks. Oh, snap. This is it. This is it. This is the game. This is the set. This is the match. And God's finally going to bring it to pass. Finally will come the answer, the complete and final and full answer to the prayers that Jesus taught us to pray thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth a new one as it is in heaven finally and fully that's why they're shouting the curse will be reversed spiritual realities will become physical realities and Satan and sin and death will be removed from the stages of life forever and forever. All the prayers of the saints over the ages will finally and fully be answered. Jesus is saying it's time. Finally, it's time. But yet, right now, today, while we are here, there are four things that are going to happen in this book. It's already happened in chapter 4, part of it, but it's going to be found in its fulfillment in 5, 6, and so forth. There's four things that are out of place that are going to be put into place. There's four truths that are going to happen that have not yet been realized, and here they are. First of all, the church will be in heaven. Today it's not. Secondly, Israel is still in unbelief. At the end, the nation will be saved. Number three, Satan is not in the lake of fire. But when the story's over, he's there for eternity. And Jesus is not on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem, but he's coming. Those four things. The church is going to heaven. Israel's going to exit unbelief and come into a saving, redeeming relationship with the Messiah of God. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Death will be eradicated. Sickness, sorrow, pain will be put behind us. And Jesus will rule and reign on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem, and we will be with him. Let's close out with this psalm. Sean, uh, Sean if you'll come. Let's look at Psalm chapter 2. We're closing with this. 
Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, that, 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 let's just stop right there. You look at that, you read that and go, that's stupid. That the kings of the earth and the people are going to try to make war with, the, with God? They're going to war against God? And Revelation reveals, yeah, yeah, they do. There's people that's so blinded by sin that they think that they can go to war with God and have a chance in hell of winning. Only to find out that hell is going to be their eternal destination. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven, chapter 4, the one who dwells in unapproachable light, shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath. That's chapters 6 through 19. And distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet, this is God speaking about his son. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me. He's talking to his son. This is the ancient of days. Daniel. I have to remember this. The Father says to the Son, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, now he's turning back to the leaders of the nations. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed in judgment of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with joy. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their choice. You're blessed this morning. We do not yet see all things having been made subject unto him. But what we do see is Jesus. He's our kinsman. And it's true. When it's all said and done, we're going to get all our stuff back. Jesus is going to get it for us. Just stand right. Are you saved? Have you put your trust in Him? Have you repented of your sin and turned fully and finally to the hope, to the promise, to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? If you have not, friend, you wrong end of the ledger. Your eternity is one of wrath. Your future destination is hell, which the Bible said was created for Satan and the demons. That the will of God is that you would not be lost. That you would not perish. He has gone to great lengths to send us a kinsman redeemer, kin to us in our flesh, Motivated by his own love, paid a debt with his own life, shed his own blood to give you entrance into the 
throne room of grace. The question is, is, have you taken advantage of that opportunity? Have you said yes to Jesus? If not, I beg of you to come now. Kiss the Son, lest He turn against you in His wrath. Kiss the Son. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. This is your moment. I'm going to pause for a second and give you time to respond before I open up the altar to everyone else to pray. This is your time to say yes to Jesus. The altar is open for everyone else to come and pray for a few moments if you would like.